Welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Anwar Youssef Dunbar, and this is Big Discussions 76, my original channel. First of all, please like this video, please share it, and please subscribe to my channel. Well, as you know, uh, on this channel now, I cover uh, one of the main topics I cover is education, uh, as that is something that I'm very passionate about. And I have a guest today uh, that I hold in very, very high regard, and we're going to talk about why that is. But I want to welcome uh, Mother Doyle. Welcome, Mother Doyle. Yes, and, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dunbar, for inviting me. I really do. Uh, you just don't know how much I appreciate this. I was talking about you this morning to a fellow colleague who I taught with, and she couldn't believe that you remembered me as your teacher from second grade. Yes. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> absolutely. Yes. Thank you for inviting me. So, yes, yeah, so we're going to get into a little bit of that. So, uh, Mother Doyle just gave some of it away. Uh, so, um, but the reason I wanted to talk to Mother Doyle, um, I, some of my subscribers are from Western New York. Others are from across the country and maybe some around the world. Uh, but Mother Doyle um, is uh, uh, an, a veteran educator, uh, but she's also um, very, very passionate about Black history. And she's uh, an icon. Uh, I consider her to be an icon, and others uh, consider her to be an icon uh, in terms of Black history and education. And so this is a, a really, really big deal. And I'm, I'm going to let the audience in on a little, uh, a, a little uh, story here. We actually tried this um, a week or a week ago uh, down at the Freedom Wall in Buffalo. And in the final version of this interview, I'm going to drop in some pictures of the Freedom Wall so people can see it. And if you come to Buffalo, uh, you might want to go over there. Uh, I recommend you go over there and see the Freedom Wall. There, there's a picture, uh, there's a painting of, of Mother Doyle along with other um, notable uh, Black history uh, figures from the Western New York area, but also from throughout uh, Black history. Um, so, Mother Doyle, so I'm going to, um, we're going we're gonna to get to how you got how you developed your love for black history. But just for context, I want, I want to ask you, uh, you know, as you said, um, as you uh, mentioned, um, you, were, you were one of my first teachers. I think that was in the first or second grade at Campus West. And you were yes. actually my first science teacher. One of, one of mm -hmm. the earliest science lessons I remember was about the Great Plains. Uh, I told you that story. I, I, won't, I won't tell yes. that again. Um, but I, I wondered what planes were, airplanes versus geography. Uh, but uh, let's start with, with your beginning. Are you from uh, Western New York? Is your family from here? Yes, well, um, I, I lived most of my uh, life um, in Buffalo, New York, but I was actually born in Niagara Falls, which is not that far from Buffalo, about a 25 or 30 minute drive. And uh, my father uh, and my mother and her relatives migrated to Niagara Falls during that great migration period when a lot of Blacks were moving all from the South and they came from Alabama and they settled in Niagara Falls. So I was born there and I went to elementary school there up until I think the second or third grade to the Niagara Street School. And my father worked at a steel plant. Most of the uh, Black men in those days worked in these old steel plants. And he worked there for about 44 years and my mother worked briefly uh, at a plant on Buffalo Avenue called Corundum. And I found out something about her that I did not know because I've been researching my family history for a long time. I'll share that with you a little bit later. But um, I moved, we moved to Buffalo and then I went to schools here in Buffalo, elementary school, junior high. I graduated from Buffalo East High School, and then I want, went on to Buffalo State College, and I received my bachelor's degree um, from Buffalo State and my master's degree in elementary education. And I, I will admit I'm struggling with my PhD. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm really struggling. I'm at the phase of writing my dissertation, um, but I do have um, a little ways to go. When you're a senior citizen, it's not easy when you're not a senior citizen, 
But when you're a senior citizen and you're doing something like working on a PhD in, in education, uh, educational le leadership is my, my theme, uh, it is not easy. And I've had to learn how to use the computer. And um, I really am fortunate that when I was teaching, I taught at the Campus West School. I taught in the Buffalo Public School System for 30 years. And 20, the last 25 years of my career were, were spent at the Campus West School. Uh, in the beginning, I don't know if you remember, but it was called the College Learning Laboratory. Yes. And then the, it, it transferred over to Campus West. And um, it was an elementary school from pre-K through grade eight. So the last 25 years, that's where I was. Now, I could have gone anywhere. I, as a matter of fact, I had principals who contacted me asking me what I considered going to their school. But one of the reasons I stayed there was because Campus West was on the campus of Buffalo State College. And we actually trained a lot of future teachers. So I actually trained a lot of student teachers and junior participants. I lectured in uh, the halls there in education and so on. And I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed working with these future teachers and that's, that's why I stayed as long as I did. Okay, yes, there's a lot of history for me personally of history there. at that school and, uh, yes. and uh, on that campus. My mother actually graduated from Buff State Yes. Uh, and me and my brother went to Campus West. Yes. You know, Campus West has been closed for some time. When they um, first uh, put up the idea of closing it, I was one of many people who spoke up at the Board of Education because it was, it was a good school. And we didn't want to see it closed, but eventually it did close. And I've been retired now for 16 years. I retired in 2004, but I have never stopped teaching. I have... I think I stayed home about two or three months after I retired and then I couldn't take it anymore. I said, I've got to, I've got to get out of here. I've got to do something. I don't want to sit home watching soap opera. So I actually um, wrote a proposal and I don't know if you're aware of this, but I wrote a proposal to the Buffalo Board of Education requesting that they hire me to be a consultant to the Board of Education for the African American uh, History Curriculum, because that's where that's what I spent most of my life doing in the public schools was teaching African American history, not only during February, because that's what people were doing. I was teaching it from September to June uh, across the curriculum in all subject areas. So I wrote the proposal, and what happened was they did hire me, so I became a consultant. And the only thing I did was go, I went into the schools from elementary to high school, and my number one focus when I went into those schools was to teach Black history to the students and to help train the teachers, because a lot of the teachers really did need the training and the materials to do this work. Okay. Okay. So. Well, well, a couple of things. Well, one thing, what you said about retirement is really, really interesting because my father is actually a retired educator out in the Albany area. Yes. And it, it does matter to have that passion when you retire. I'll just say that. Yes, that's important. I, I wanted to add something. Not only, um, one of the things I was doing during the time that I was teaching for those years was I started to write. And um, what really, I think one, there were a lot of reasons I got into to teaching black history and wanting to learn it. But um, there, there was a time when Buffalo was celebrating 150 years of history and it went to the school library at Campus West. I wanted to find a book that would teach my students about local black history. Well, I went to the school library and there was no book. Mm -hmm. And I remember my husband, uh, my husband has been deceased for some time, but I remember when I came home and I told him, I said, they, they don't have a book. I, I want to read something to my children about Buffalo's Black history. And he said, why don't you write one? And I said, I never wrote a book before. He said, well, you're always talking. I'm sure you could write a book. So I, I wrote a very simple book. And I don't know if you're going to be able to see it, but I'm going to hold it up. And is, is that something I can do or? Sure. Dr. Here's the very first book uh, of a little further. 
We'll just of, okay, okay, of 12, uh, Buffalo's. Of, okay, okay, yeah. of twelve books that I have written, this is the very first book, and the title is Buffalo's Black Community. Now, the a, Buffalo State College was right across the street from the Buffalo History Museum. In those days, it was called the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society, but they have changed the name. So every day when I left my classroom, I went across the street to the Buffalo History Museum for six straight months, I did this research. And this is a result, 20 page book talking about just a little bit of history about Buffalo's black community. Um, I talked about the names of the streets, Jefferson, very popular street in Buffalo, and, and the fact that it was had another name, it was called Pollard Street. Right now, it's mostly African American, but in those days, in the early 1900s, there were only Germans who lived there. So all of this is in this book. And I also identified the very first Black person to come to Buffalo the very first black man in the city of Buffalo in the late 1790s, his name was Joseph Hodge. So this is only 20 pages and I wrote it for children. And I had a, a when parents looked at it, they would say, well, Miss Doyle, I don't consider this to be a children's book because I don't know half the things that are in this book. It's a very popular book, Dr. Dunbar, and it has been reprinted dozens of times, dozens of times. So. Um, and, and I have to tell you a secret. My three children, who are now adults, are on the cover of the book. Oh, wow. Um, yes. At the time, my daughter, my youngest son, uh, my second oldest son, and my daughter, my, my um, youngest son, I hate to admit it, will be 50 years old in December. Wow. So I'm telling my age, folks, but this started me to write and the more I learned and I think this is a, another reason why I'm into this the more I was writing and the more I information uncovered about black history not only in the city of Buffalo but in general the more I wanted to learn and the more I realized was I didn't really know it I had a bachelor's degree I had a master's degree at that time I was not taught Black history when I came through those college classrooms. So um, I'm, I'm continuing to write and maybe we'll talk about some of my other books a little later on in the discussion. Okay, okay. So I, I wanna go back. Um, you, you answered one question um, for the most part. Uh, what initially got you um, interested in education when you were first starting out? Well, um, my on uh, my mother and, and I'm doing research in my family. I've been research, researching my family history now for 20 years, and that's another whole topic. But um, as I was growing up, I I found out that on my mother's side of the family, there were a lot of educators. And uh, later on, when I was really getting into this this research, I found out that there was there were 16 educators, and to my surprise there was also a minister. And so, and I, I met a few of them when, as, as I was growing up and I was kind of, I was inspired because of what they had um, done with their lives in terms of going into education. That was one thing that inspired me. And then when I was a little girl, like little girls do, I used to play school a lot. And I was all, and my, and I would be the teacher and my siblings would be, of course, I kind of made them be the students. So I, I grew up with this passion for teaching. And, and I had those examples in my own family of people who had gone into education. And, um, and so it's just something that I just had loved. I think I have two loves, maybe no, three. One is teaching, which I still do as I'm retired. The other is writing, because I love to write. And the other is just learning more about African American history. And I, I failed to, to mention that I also write a newspaper column because that's a part of my life, life too. I write for the oldest black newspaper in Western New York, the Criterion newspaper. I just want to hold it up. It's a full, it's a full newspaper. 
It's the Criterion newspaper. Mm -hmm. It's the oldest black newspaper in Western New York. It is owned and operated by the very distinguished African-American family, the Frank Merriweather family. We, they even have a library named after them, the Merriweather Library. The paper is 95 years old and my column uh, it's really, the name of my column is really um, what everybody knows me by, Eye on History. That's the name of the column. Mm -hmm. And it will, it's 41 years old, the newspaper column. For 41 straight years, it has never missed a week being published, not only in the city of Buffalo, but it has been published in other national newspapers around the country, including the Chicago Defender, the African American Chronicle in Chicago, the Palm Beach Gazette in Florida, Class Magazine, and also in a major newspaper here in Buffalo, the Buffalo News. But it, and it started in the other black newspaper, the Challenger. You probably remember the Challenger, which is published by Alnisa Banks. That's where it started. Eye on History, 1979, and I I really thank her and appreciate her giving me that opportunity opportunity to write that column. And if someone had said to me, when I first write, wrote that first article, which is just an article I wrote about Dr. King, that I would still be writing this column 41 years later, and after 3,000 plus articles on Black history, I would never have believed them. But here I am, and I'm still writing it. Okay. So, yeah. Ms. Doyle, let me ask you this. So you initially, what sparked your interest in Black history was that there just wasn't a lot uh, out there for us to learn, or, or yeah, yes. just, just for people to study and yeah. just to know. But the writing actually started from uh, Ion History? So, well, the writing so started- how it kind of came together? Yes, well, well I, I never will forget it. I was coming from a day of teaching at Campus West. And I was coming, um, one, of, one of our main streets in the black community is called Fillmore Avenue. Mm -hmm. And I was coming down Fillmore, which is a block from the Martin Luther King Park. And I stopped by the office as a challenger. This is 1979. And it was the end of January. And I, I went in and talked to the editor, El Nisa, we call her sister El Nisa. I said, I just want, I want to write an article in honor of Dr. King. And she said, sure, go ahead. I wrote the article. And then the next time I saw her, she said, um, why don't you write another article? That, that was a pretty good article. So I said, okay. So it just snowballed from there. I it just, and then she suggested, why did you write a column? And she was the one, and probably today if, if I were to talk to her, she was the one who actually gave me the title. Why don't you call it Eye on History? That was 41 years ago. Wow. And so then um, later on, I wrote, I started to write for the Criterion, and I've been with the Criterion for many, many years. And as a matter of fact, I just, and the one day that I write the column uh, every Tuesday, every Tuesday for 41 years, sometimes on a Wednesday, now that I'm getting older and I'm, I'm not as uh, energetic as I used to be. But for the majority of the time, every Tuesday evening, I would write this column. And my adult children who have children now, when they call me on a Tuesday, they'll say, oh, I forgot. This is Tuesday, you're writing your articles. <laughs> I'll call you later. <laughs> so that became a tradition and it's still, I'm still doing it. Okay. Doing now, it. in addition to the columns, You've written numerous books, right? Yes, I, I've written, uh, I just showed you the first book, I, uh, Buffalo's Black Community. And let me just say this, because I know a lot of people will see this and they, be, they may not be in Western New York. They may be in other areas of the country. I always encourage people, um, uh, especially African-Americans, uh, to, to learn about their own cities and their own environment and, and the, the history there. Um, for example, I, I've, I've traveled to Chicago many times, and I always visited the DeSalvo Museum, which was named after the founder of the city of Chicago. 
And I always wondered if people there really know about this beautiful museum and all this history there. But so I just suggest that people do that. Now, um, the, the other book, I, this was my second book. This was, um, again, you see me, Eye on History. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, I, the way I describe this book is 180 pages of pure African history. And actually, um, the, the columns, that I, I actually took a lot of the columns, 50 of the most popular columns I wrote, and I just put them in this book. And it goes all the way back to thousands of years ago, and, and there's a, a, a title, Black Egypt, uh, the Black Kings, the Black Queens, and all of these things which I, which I was learning about, and I wanted to share it with people. And uh, this book has been reprinted many, many times, and I changed the cover many times, mm -hmm. and I added the Sankofa symbol on the back, which is a West African symbol, which means to go back, go back and fetch our history, our culture, our traditions as a, as a people, bring it forward, and learn the lessons from the past. That's the Sankofa symbol. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of history in, in this book. And um, we have a festival here in Boston. Well, well this, because of the COVID-19, a lot of things have been canceled. We, but we've had a very important festival in Buffalo called the Juneteenth Festival. And um, a lot of people may know about it. It's been in the news. Um, Juneteenth was a, a, was a celebration of freedom. And so we celebrate the fact that a lot of uh, enslaved Africans did not really get their freedom when the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. Some people uh, don't realize that. So we celebrate Juneteenth. But the reason I'm bringing it up is because when we have this festival, we have a lot of vendors. We have a lot of people who sell a lot of African-centered materials, items, and so on. And I always have this book. And this book is always uh, when people come to my table, they'll say, do you have eye on history? And it's it's just, I, I think I only have maybe three or four copies left. Um, then um, I've also written some other books I wanted to show you, and I've got them right here. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is, just to show you how deep this goes, <laughs> this is a book called The African Roots of Ludwig von Beethoven. Okay. And the reason I wrote this is when I was doing one of the articles on the African history book of Beethoven, I, I, I was encouraged and inspired to do more research. I said, you know what, let me write a little book. It's, see, my books are not really, the only one that's, uh, that will take you some time to read is the Ion History book, 180 pages. But I guess I, people are busy. I try to come up with something where people can read quick, get the information. It's like McDonald's, <laughs> and you go through the drive through. You get every, you're supposed to get things quickly, but this way they can get a sense of history and they can do it very, very quickly. But I wanna share this one with you. This is called Warren Gamalia Harding, one of America's black presidents. Because as I was doing the research, I found out that a good number of our former presidents had African ancestry. Wow. And I wanted to talk about Harding, especially Harding. So I, I wrote this book. I did a lot of research. I think I read about 18 books to get all the information about him and to document everything that I was saying. Um, one of the large newspapers, uh, they heard about the book here in Buffalo. And the reporter came and she sat in my living room for a little over an hour asking me about the book and how, how I got the information and everything. And then she said this, she asked me a question. She said, Miss Doyle, if somebody challenges you and what you have said in this book about Warren Harding and the other black presidents that you mentioned, uh, what will you do? So I said to her, well, first of all, I won't accept the challenge. She said, why not? I said, I will only accept their challenge if they can prove to me that they read all 18 books that I read and they went, went back to the 1700s 
uh, because I list the newspapers where I got this information and they can tell me all this information. And one of the books, I went to our local library, they didn't have the book I was looking for. They had to send for the book from California. So I did a lot of, a lot of research. And I said, if they can show me that, then I'll sit down and I will have a conversation with them. Some of the other uh, presidents in here, I, I know, uh, who I named, who have African ancestry, Abraham Lincoln. Wow. Is one of them. Thomas Jefferson is another one. Andrew Jackson is another one. Wow. And also, um, I used uh, some research, other museums like the Schomburg. I used that too. So when I do this work, it's not just off the top of my head. It, requir it requires a lot of reading, hours and hours and hours of reading. I told my students this when I was teaching. I said, if you write history, it's very important that you're able to document what you have written because somebody is going to ask you a question. How do you know? Where did you get the information? So that's why I spend so much and I'm, I'm in the process of doing some more information for another book I'm writing. And um, so in between everything, when I should be resting and enjoying my retirement, I'll be at the library, I'll be at the Buffalo History Museum to get the information because so, it's interesting. It's so interesting. Yes. Um, I, can I share one more thing? Sure. Okay. I bought a magazine. I was at the I was at the grocery store last week, and I happened to look on the side, and I saw a uh, National National Geographic. And I wasn't going to buy it because the I looked at the price, and it was very expensive. But the whole book was dedicated to the discovery of the Titanic that ill-fated ship that went down in the Atlantic Ocean in the early 1900s. I said, oh, I gotta read this book. I've gotta read this book. And the reason for that, and I read it from cover to cover. This is what I was looking for. I was looking for the name of the black family that was on the Titanic. And guess what? They didn't mention the black family that was on the Titanic, the Joseph LaRoche family, who he was on the Titanic, and here I have a book and for your listeners and your people who are watching this, which I just, just discovered. See, this is, this is the beautiful thing about doing this research. I'm con constantly discovering things. Black Man on the Titanic, the story of Joseph LaRoche, and I, I will spell it L-A-R-O-C-H-E. His wife was pregnant with, the, with their third child. Then they had two smaller children on the ship. They were in um, the second class, but the second class was very ornate. It was very comfortable. Um, it was a very nice place to be. And when the ship began to sink, he put his family on rescue boat number 14. But he went down with the ship. Wow. There was a museum in Chicago that did a huge exhibit on them. And if, if you look up the, the passenger list on the Titanic, you will see this family's name. And he was related to one of the future kings of Haiti. And um, so now Hollywood, somebody who was a producer or whoever, they've got to remake the Titanic. <laughs> remake the Titanic. And when they do, put this black family on that ship and build a story around them because it's a fascinating story. And if I have anything to do with it, I'm hoping to write somebody. I'm definitely gonna write this magazine and tell them you left out this family's name. But now I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they didn't know, but they're on the passenger list. Wow. But maybe they saw the name and didn't realize that they were black folks. So that's, that's part of my life's work. <laughs> okay, so you just touched on something I wanna come back to. Um, but before, before we move on, going back to trying to identify the black history in whatever your home city is, mm -hmm. 
that's significant because they named the street uh, after Bill Gator. And well, yes, there is a street named after him. Who was yes, up. and I, pa I passed by that street so many times, but it wasn't until I went to the Freedom Wall last week that I, I looked at his picture and I read, his, read about him. Yes. And I didn't know who that was. Yeah. So, so yes, the, there's so much stuff around us yeah. that we take for granted every day that we, mm -hmm. don't, we just don't know. Well, we're having a controversy in Buffalo, and this is just this just, just this just came up recently. One of our uh, main streets is named Fillmore Avenue. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, with the mass the protests and the demonstrations going on around the country, and people asking for so for racial justice. Now in our city, people want that name, Fillmore, removed. Why? Because Millen Fillmore, the 13th president of the United States, and he was very active in Western New York because he started out, started out as a lawyer, but he signed the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. The Fugitive Slave Law said that any fugitive slave that got this far in Western New York. And Western New York was very important on the Underground Railroad because of our proximity to Canada. So the law said that the bounty hunters who were coming up here looking for fugitive slaves had the right to, to capture these slaves and take them in chains back south into slavery. He signed that law in 1850 and if you were caught you could be fined over a thousand dollars and 1850 a thousand dollars was a lot of money or you could be put in prison so a lot of people are are looking to say you know this street fillmore avenue runs into the black community but you you might have heard this one of our large universities here the university of buffalo they have had his name removed from a lot of their buildings about a month ago. So now we have to do something about the street. So okay. there is a, there's, wow. there's an outcry that to have his name removed. And we're not saying, and there are statues of him, we're not saying tear down statues or anything, but we have a Buffalo History Museum. Maybe you could put the statue in the museum, give him his proper uh, respect as being the 13th president of the United States, Certainly, I'm not trying to take that away from him. We're just saying we don't want to look up and see Fillmore Avenue as Black folks travel down Fillmore Avenue because our folks were forced back into slavery. Wow. And for those unfamiliar with, with Western New York, that's a main artery. Yes, of, one of them. Of yeah. the city of Buffalo. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, Mother Doyle, um, so we're about halfway through. Uh, I have a. Um, this next question is a little controversial, and I'm going to front it by saying that as a scientist, I've, I've lived in different places and I've worked in research labs with people from other cultures, many of them Asian, uh, some of them Jewish. And I noticed that they take the passing on of their history and their culture, they take it, a lot of it on themselves. Yes. Um, when I when I was a postdoc, my postdoctoral advisor was Chinese, and they had their children in a Chinese school on Saturdays to learn their culture. And so I was saying that to say that uh, you know when I was at Hutch Tech, I remember my mother and some other parents got upset because there was no Black History program at the school. And mm -hmm. so someone like me, I learned Black History very piecemeal through Black History programs at my church. Um, during Black History Month from rap music mm -hmm. and, and from word of mouth. I only learned about the Moors because um, my friend uh, Kenny uh, was very, very passionate about, about Black history. And, and one day at a family gathering, he started talking about the Moors. I had no idea who that was or what, what they were. I had no idea as a scientist who someone like Percy Julian was until a mentor gave me a copy of his documentary, Forgotten Genius. And there are a lot of black astronauts. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so there's just, so, so I guess my question is, whose responsibility is it to pass this on? Um, is it the school systems or is it our peoples or is it a little bit of everything? Well, ideally, 
all of this teaching should begin in the home. Mm -hmm. But I always say um, a lot of the parents really don't know the history themselves. Especially now when you have so many young parents raising children, they don't know the history. So that's where it should start. However, the way I look at it now is that everybody should, should it, it's a responsibility of the entire community. It's a responsibility of the, the family. It's a responsibility of the community, our community centers, our organizations, uh, and all of these things. And we should be utilizing our churches a great deal. I've, I've written about this a lot. Hmm. Of course, now with COVID-19, a lot of the churches, some of them are beginning to open because the, the society is beginning to open up. But a lot of ch churches have b buildings and uh, rooms that this could happen on a Saturday school, for example. Like the Jewish community does a lot of that kind of teaching. We're not doing enough, and, and I have been preaching this for a long time. There's too many gaps in our, our knowledge of our own history. I was, I was watching a news program on, of a city that's not that far from here, Rochester, New York. It's only about maybe an hour or two from Buffalo when you get on the throughway. And they were trying to put in a curriculum on African-American history. And one of the African-American teachers was saying, um, she went to an in-service and she said, I didn't know that it was a black man who invented traffic light, Garrett Morgan. Uh, I didn't know that it was a, an African-American scientist who, who uh, helped to further develop the carbon filament in the light bulb, Lewis Latimer. Edison, Thomas Edison got all the credit for that. Um, but she was going, going, and I said to myself, this is 2020. And here's a, here's a teacher who's teaching children, and she's African-American, and she doesn't know this. So we have a lot of work to do, Dr. Dunbar. We have a lot of work. Everybody has to get involved. You know, um, one of the things that I have done, and, and it's kind of, uh, and you probably saw it when you went to, the, to, to my website, I'm the only person in Western New York who does Black History billboards. I started doing the bill, billboards about eight years ago. And the reason I did the billboards is because I was writing in our community, the Black community, and every time I looked up at a billboard, I saw another person from another group and, and not being prejudiced or anything, but I didn't see us. The only time I saw us is somebody was trying to sell um, alcohol or something like something that wasn't going to help us. So I made a decision. I said, you know what? I'm going to put African-American history on a billboard. So when people ride around, and they look up, they're going to see African-American people who have done things. So, for example, around July the 4th, I highlighted Crystal's Addicts, who was the first Black to die in the American Revolution. I got a picture of him. The company I work with in doing the billboards, we put his picture up there, and we said the first man to die in the American Revolution. Christmas addicts. And um, also, um, I'm trying to think of the, the name of the um, uh, Ike Murphy, who just went through the Kentucky Derby. Mm -hmm. We never identified Ike Murphy. He was one of the best um, jockeys in the Kentucky Derby in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So I got his picture. Put it up on the building board. Isaac Murphy, who ran over a thousand races and won over 600 of those races. And when people ride past those billboards and they look up and they see pictures and they see information about African Americans that they have never seen before. Now I have a special billboard coming up on September the 20th. I don't know when your your program was going to go, but September 25th. And not getting political, but it's going to be related to the election. Okay. It's simply going it, to it's the pictures are going to make people stop and think because I want to encourage people to vote. I 
whoever you vote for, I want to encourage you. So when you look up at this billboard, you're going to see these words. Remember the struggle for the right to vote. And in large print, you're going to see these wor this word three times, vote, vote, vote. And at the upper left-hand corner of this billboard, you're going to see Dr. Martin Luther King, and on one side of him is a white police officer on the left and a white police officer on the right, and they have his hands behind him in handcuffs. To illustrate the fact that Dr. King was arrested numerous times because he led movements for the right to go. I want people to see that image. And so that's coming and it's going to be put up from the September 25th through the month of October, but it's going to cause people to stop and think. And I'll tell you one thing else that I started to do in the last six billboards, I asked the artist to do this for me. I said, on each one of these billboards, in the lower right-hand corner, I want you to put the Sankofa symbol. Now, these are all Caucasian. This is a Caucasian company, and the artists are all Caucasian. So they looked at me, what is this? What is the Sankofa symbol? <laughs> So I had to teach. So by me doing these billboards, I am teaching people from other ethnic groups. They're doing the billboards for me. They're doing the creating the design I give them. But I, I'm teaching them because they had never heard of the Sankofa symbol before in their life. So I guess what I'm saying that is there is so many different ways of teaching our history. We can use the visuals. We can use the books. We can use the computers. Our children are all involved in social media. I have a Facebook page and I teach black history on my Facebook page. Okay. So anyway, what is what did Malcolm say? By any means necessary. Okay. All right. I don't know if I um, answered your question. When we, when we get finished, I'm gonna ask you about how people can contact you and we're almost at, at the end now going back to the titanic story yes um that's an example of selective storytelling yes it and is. i think and we see this all the time selective storytelling is very very dangerous because he or she who controls the narrative can control that's right. how whole communities feel about themselves and going, going back to my percy julian story when I finally watched that documentary, I just said, you know what, I could have, I could have, it would have helped me to see this 10 years earlier. I mean, I'm fortunate that I finished my PhD, but here's a man who had done it and he'd done all the struggle, he'd gone through his struggles, mm -hmm. but, but this was already, this was already done. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I, it would have been helpful for me to know that. And I think it'll be helpful for other black scientists to know that with, oh, yeah. civil, with civil rights, uh, I'll, do, I'll do two more with civil rights, and I'm not saying it's bad, but you know that we, we hear a certain number of names. But I recently learned about who someone like uh, Fred Hampton is. Uh, I had no idea who Fred Hampton was, uh, and of course, I'm going to mention my brother. He, he some some people feel like there are too many slave movies. Um, so so that so those those are so the imaging matters. Uh, the imaging definitely matters. Mm -hmm. um, have, have you experienced that a lot, that there's selective? Yes, uh, I, I just want to say this, because uh, because this kind of ties in with what you're saying. Um, I also uh, do essay contests. Okay. I have, I have introduced more than 150 essay contests throughout Western New York and beyond um, for a long time now. And my most recent e uh, essay contest, and I just ask people, I have a topic. And I have the, the questions that people have to respond to. And so one of the contests, when, when Congressman John Lewis passed, the topic of the essay contest was lessons from civil rights leader, leaders, John Lewis and Reverend C.T. Vivian. Now, the reason I added Reverend C.T. Vivian was because he died on the same day that John Lewis passed away. Oh, wow. And he was a major civil rights figure, but we don't know that much about him. We don't know 
what he did. And I remember reading a story when he was leading all these marches for the right to vote, and he went to the courthouse to, to cast his vote, I believe it was in Selma, and the white police officer or the sheriff was standing at the door, and he said, what do you want? He said, well, I'm here to vote. The white police officer took his fist and hit Reverend C.T. Vivian so hard and knocked him backwards, hit his head on the ground, and blood just went everywhere. But he had a tremendous um, history of, of leading these marches. We know about Dr. King. We know about Reverend, uh, I mean, uh, John Lewis. Uh, some people probably just learned about him when he passed, because I, I heard people say, well, I didn't know anything about him. But the reason I added Reverend C.T. Vivian, this was an opportunity for people to learn about him. Because when you do the essay contest like this, you got to do some research. Because the first question I asked, describe the, the achievements of, Rev, of uh, John Lewis and Reverend C.T. Vivian. Mm -hmm. So people had to do some research. And I had somebody say, well, I never heard of him before. I said, well, are you going to enter this contest? You got to do some research. So I do, I do these essay contests to, to, first of all, make people think, introduce them to people they have never heard of before, encourage them to do some research and to enhance the writing. And by the way, I do have um, um, money prizes. I fund the essay contest myself because I think it is important for our people. This is another way. This goes back to what I was saying. By any means necessary, the billboards, the essay contest, the books, uh, and my radio show, which is called Eye on History. And I use my radio show to teach African-American history, just like I use my Facebook page. And on my last radio show, since the, the country, uh, now everybody's uh, up in arms and protesting and demonstrating and everybody's talking about racism. But I wanted to introduce my audience to Dr. France, Francis Cress Welsing. I wanted them to hear her, and I have her on tape. I have the DVD when she does during the teaching, but I also have her on audio. I played her comments, commentary on racism and why racism is so, uh, so um, important and why African people receive this negativity from other people. And she explained it so well. I also have uh, used the comments from uh, Kwame Ture, formerly Stokely Carmont. I have him in tape. So I, I, do, I use all of this because, because people are listening, because my radio show not only comes on the regular radios uh, stations, but it also you can hear it on the internet as well. So maybe at the end of the discussion, I could tell people how they can tune into it. Okay. And it's called Eye on History. Okay. Well, Mother Doyle, you're, you know, after this, I, I think I'm going to update some of my own messaging uh, based upon what we talked about here. Yes. So before we finish, because we're right at the end, can you talk just briefly about uh, the significance of the name Mother Doyle? Because you asked me to. Yes. Well, uh, you know, uh, that's kind of happened. Uh, I'm, I have been very active in the community and I have been a member of a lot of, uh, of groups in Buffalo. And, um, and these groups I have been a part of, um, they try to improve the community in a lot of different ways. And I was a member of a group called the, um, the, Black, the Buffalo Local Action Committee. I think that was the name of it. And there was a lot of young men and they started to call me Mother Doyle. And this was like, um, maybe 15 years ago. So they started calling me Mother Doyle. And then um, as I was going around the community, because I speak at, um, and I lecture on African-American history a lot, in, in not only at the libraries, uh, but also at the History Museum and so on. And so people started, and it just sort of stuck. And then I asked one day, I asked one person, I said, why are they calling me this? And, and, and the response was, it's a sign of respect. 
it's a sign of respect, Mother Doyle, and this is why people do it. But it's not only me. It's 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 like mother. Um, it's it's like in our churches we have like the elders, we have the missionaries, we have uh, the women in the church, and they're called mother. I, my mother-in-law Essie Doyle was called Mother Essie Doyle for many many years. So I consider it to be an honor. Um, like I said, it, it's just stuck and. People just, and even people who are not African-American have been calling me Mother Doyle. So it's just a sign of respect. Okay. It's out of the tradition, I think, of African people, respecting the elders. I think that, I think that's what it's all about. Okay. Well, Mother Doyle, we are just about at the end of what I have here. Do you have any other comments or, or words of wisdom or any other stories you want to? Well, I just want to add something. Uh, one of the other things I've done, because I've been trying to give your audience some different kind of uh, ways that they can um, maybe use in their own communities and think about it. Um, for example, when I started doing the essay contest, I, would, I had advertised it in a uh, in the, the Final Call newspaper. Mm -hmm. I would always put it in there. And then a couple of years after that, I found, I found that some of uh, that the, the, the idea of the essay contest were picked up by some of the people in the community there in Chicago. So maybe they had never thought about that before, but they, the idea was picked up. Um, also, I wanted to say another thing I've done, I have invited a number of national leaders to Buffalo, national people, for example, Tariq Nasheed, who was the producer of the Hidden Colors series oh, yes. of films, uh, Dr. Kaba Kamene, formerly Dr. Booker T. Coleman, I have invited him to Buffalo, Dr. Juwan Kunshu, the, the great educator, I have, these have been my special guests. Now, I didn't have any money. These people cost money. So when I was sitting down saying, well, you know, I, I'd like to invite Dr. Kunshuvo and Tariq Nasheed and, uh, and the math doctor, Dr. Shahid Muhammad from the University of Islam. I didn't have any money. So you know what I did? I went to the community. I got on my radio show. I used my newspaper column and I said, I need help. And I had fundraisers and the people came out. Now when Tariq, when Tariq Rashid came out, I think he, when he came to Buffalo, and he, it's my guess, I think he had done Hidden Colors three or four. I don't know which one it was. And um, so I talked to him and we ne ne negotiated the price. And then I said to him, no, no, I can't do that now. So I got him down a little bit. I won't tell you what it was, but let me tell you how I got, how I was able to pay him. Uh -huh. We, uh, I rented a theater. At that time, it was the Market Arcade Theater. It's no longer downtown, but we, you know, not there anymore. Wow. I rented the theater, and I said, now, how am I going to pay for this theater? We uh, had some tickets printed. I advertised that Tariq Nasheed was coming to Buffalo. Everybody knew him because they had saw Hidden Colors, and we sold tickets. And let me tell you, that theater was packed from front to back. People came from outside of Buffalo. They came from Fredonia. They came from Brockport. A lot of college students, because he was very popular. And he came, so I was able to pay him. Same thing when I had these other people come uh, to Buffalo. I, I got on um, in, in the uh, media and I raised the money. So there, even if you don't have any money, you could have a vision, but you just, you get people to support you. And people, you know what I, I found, uh, Dr. Dunbar, people will support you if they trust you, if they know you. Because I had a reputation in the city of Buffalo. And, and now, uh, and I still don't have any money. And people, <laughs> people I, I had a program about um, two weeks ago at a local restaurant. It's a popular black owned restaurant. And I gave away 100 Black History activity books. And I said, now, how am I going to do this? So there was a couple that owns a Black bookstore on Jefferson, uh, Sharon and Kitty Holly. It's called Zawadi Books. And I said, you know, I want to give away 100 books for our young people. So uh, they donated 25 books. 
Then a friend of mine heard about it. He donated 25 books and I purchased the rest of them. And they came up with a hundred and we gave them away and we had a good time. The young people enjoyed them. They were all activity books, um, inventors and scientists and civil rights leaders. And the nice, things, the nice thing about these books, they integrated uh, language arts, writing, geography, and you name it. So they're not only learning about black history, but they're using their academic skills. So my, my I wanna leave, uh, and we didn't get into ge genealogy, maybe that's another uh, lecture for another time. And I can tell you how to, uh, I was able to research my family history going back to 1845, but that's another lecture. But my, my uh, thing I like to leave with your audience is, when you learn your history, share it. Don't keep it to yourself. Share it with young people, share it with the, your community, share it with the neighborhood children. As a family down the street from where I live, they have about four or five children. I'm always giving them materials and things to help. We have to become a people to care about one another. I think that's missing now. So that's what I wanna leave with everybody is learn your history. And this is what I say at the end of every one of my radio shows. I'm gonna say it here for all to hear. This is Mother Doyle, keep your eye on history. Thank you, Dr. Dunbar. <laughs> Very good, well thank you, Mother Doyle. Mother Doyle, where can people find you? Uh, you have a website, you're on Facebook. Where can yes. people find you? Uh, I, my website is um, www.eva, E-V-A, M, they have to put that M there, Doyle, evamdoyle.com. And when you go to the website, uh, there's a lot of information there, the, the list of, of my books, uh, my bio, and all that kind of stuff. And pictures of some of my uh, billboards are there. Um, they can call me, I don't mind. Uh, my, my phone number is always on my billboard, so... People, it's area code 716-847-6010. And if you go to my website, my email address is there. So you can leave me a message. Um, I, I've been in, invited to, to speak in uh, North Carolina and um, Geneva, New York and um, Rochester. Uh, although I will say this, I really am not traveling now because of COVID-19, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not good. I, uh, you know, I'm a senior citizen now. So, and by the way, I do my radio show remotely from home. Now you can tune into my radio show. Uh, it's WUFO 1080 AM and 96.5 FM. And you can uh, tune in for, uh, through the internet. You can hear me. I come on twice a month, the first Saturday and the third Saturday of each month from 11 a.m. Eastern time, 11 a.m. to 11.30. It's just a half hour program with a lot of black history. A lot of black history. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll have to <laughs> tune in myself Yes. and uh, learn, listen and learn. Yes, and you never get too old to learn because I'm a great grandmother. I do, let me just say, I have three adult children. I have seven grandchildren, they're all grown. And I have four great grandchildren and they're all toddlers. So um, I'm quite busy and, and let me tell you, it doesn't matter how old you are, you never get too old to learn. Okay. But one day I'll finish that dissertation, Dr. Dunbar. <laughs> okay. All right. And I'll call you Dr. Doyle. Uh, well, I, I think we'll we'll stop there. Uh, Mother Doyle, thank you again for uh, you know for the first time we met and then giving me some more time today. Uh, this this is probably one of my most fun interviews, and it means a lot with our history and uh, just with your your breadth of knowledge. So I'm gonna leave Mother Doyle's website in the uh, description box below and I'll leave her Facebook link as well. You can go there and, and uh, reach out to her if you'd like. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions or comments uh, in the comment uh, section below. And um, perhaps we can do this again, Mother Doyle. Um,
Yes, yeah. Maybe, maybe one day we could do the section on uh, how to, to trace your family roots. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely know me and some of my relatives are, we're interested in that. Yes. So. Okay. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate it. And uh, I just want to say, uh, like I said, this is just amazing that you could remember going all the way back so those many years. And I just want to let the audience know, um, you, you were just a, such a nice gentleman. And um, your mom should be so proud of you. I just wanted to say that. And thank you again. Um, and I say this in Kiswahili, Asante Sana. Thank you very much for the opportunity. All right. Well, everyone, please like this video, please share it, and please subscribe to my channel. And as always, remember that your attitude determines your altitude. Take care, and I'll talk to you the next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. We have with race, yes, is because people don't know each other, they don't understand each other's history, yes, they haven't been taught because the same schools that we went to, yes, they went to the same history they learned, we learned, and they don't know it. And, and I, I, I speak all over the city and outside of Buffalo, and I speak to not only African Americans but to white audiences. And, and the, the thing that people will say the most. I never knew that before, Mother Dora. So I love sharing the history. Um, one of the first.